I cannot say how excited I am today to look around this room and see everybody here. We really hope that we have pulled together a um, group of individuals who I know will dazzle you and have you walking away with maybe some new ideas and new contacts. And so without further ado, I'm excited to introduce Randy Matulka. He's our Executive Director for the Agency for Economic Prosperity. <laughs>
don't know because already this morning I've heard from many of you about how you cannot find the skilled workers that you need. So as I did a little research, we noted that there are 7.6 million unfilled jobs in the United States right now. That's a lot of people, and the majority of those are skilled jobs. Uh, Three million workers needed for the nation's infrastructure upgrades in the next year. Again, a lot of jobs. And the educational partners, your educational partners in Lake County, really work together to provide that skilled workforce. So whether it's Lake Technical College, Lake Sumter State College, Lake County School District, we all work together to try to do our best to prepare our students for you. So it was just a few years ago when we were standing here at a very similar um, session talking about a manufacturing center, a dream that was really brought to me by Sky Gold. So Deborah Bowers, I always credit her. She came to me one day and said, we need some CNC machinists. And we didn't have a program for that. And so one thing led to another, but very thankfully for you all, our local manufacturers, our local legislators, the governor, it became a reality. Thanks to Evergreen Construction, I know he's in the room. We have a beautiful Center for Advanced Manufacturing, and um, now this is a reality. It's his Okay, so here's our welding portion of that 24,000 square foot Center for Advanced Manufacturing, where we're now teaching about 80 students. We have welding programs starting at 7:30 in the morning, running until 10 o'clock at night. Not stop. They are welding morning and night. Everybody gets a job. Everybody's grabbed from us before we can finish them. So if you do that to us, I tell you, please just wait till we get them completed. Um, but uh, we're we're doing the very best we can to serve that welding industry that's um, in our community and, and the surrounding region. From there, we also opened our CNC machining program, and we are building that. We have about twenty students that graduated last year. Uh, we have 15 students enrolled today. We have all our equipment now. We're rare to go. They are, they are prepared to be um, entry-level machinists with you. Um, we have partnered with NASA, and they are making a part of a locker for the space station, which I think is pretty cool. So they can put on their resume that, that um, they did something for NASA. So we're going strong in both those areas. When it comes to construction, and Lori Ryan will talk to you a little bit more about construction as, as we go on today, but we have started an introduction to construction course to prepare students again with some basics for local contractors who are desperate for people, and we're working on apprenticeship programs. So we have submitted an application for a, an HVAC apprenticeship program to go along with our current uh, uh, HVAC program that we're offering on campus, and then we're working in partnership with Lake Sumter State College on an electrical apprenticeship program. And then we also, um, hopefully, will be working on an introduction to carpentry or a carpentry apprenticeship program as time comes on. So we are here to help you and serve you, and we certainly want to know how we can do that. So please let us know how we can prepare your workforce, because that is our mission. That is our mission in Lake County and our region, preparing people to go to work for you. So thank you very much.
His company won this contract because John and his chief engineer, Frank Stuhlman, had developed a way to use computer assistance to interpolate manufactured parts. They were able to use and adapt on the old, um, I guess you could say the old punch card adding machine tapes to create parts, uh, uh, to, to make, make patterns for parts. By using that punch card technology, they developed part outlines that, that were used by machine operators. But this was in the days before machine control, 1947, 1948. So you had a, um, a dimensional layout of a part. One operator was calling out dimensions. Two other operators were operating a machine tool moving the X and Y axis manually because there weren't servo controls to operate the equipment. John, being the innovator that, that he was, um, and Frank, who had come from Carnegie Mellon University, weren't happy with that process, although it was more accurate than anything else that had already been dreamed of. Because what they had done had actually developed the outline of numerical control. So John, John, he tells the story because I was able to sit down with him about how he Frank made a trip to MIT because um, the, the fellows up there had developed this thing called the computer. So they went up to MIT and described their problem and working with MIT, they developed the first numerical programming language called ACT, Automated Production, Production Technology. Working with MIT and IBM, they developed suitable controls. In 1958, John received a patent for motor controlled apparatus for position machine tools. In 1958, the two operators that were manually moving the machine tool were replaced by servo control mechanisms. It was a birth of computer numerical control. Many of you, do many of you remember punch cards? The American program of punch cards? And John and I had. So, so, had any of you remember paper tape for machining? Again, the continuous punch card for repeat the machine. John and Frank invented that technology which led to what we have today. John was inducted into the National, um, what, I'm sorry, John received the patent in 1985. John and Frank were presented the National Medal of Technology by President Reagan. John was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 1993. And John is known as the father of computer numerical control. But John Parsons was just this cool guy. Um, I was up in Traverse City building a technology center in the part in the on Parsons Avenue, where his factory was located. The, the center that we built was eventually called the Parsons Student Center. And John would come in and sit down and talk about the challenges and changes, fascinating by the things that we saw in manufacturing. He would be amazed today by the technologies that we have. The ability to make a part that you could use under the hood of an automobile out of plastic. The ability to make a part out of a pile of dust, additive manufacturing. The ability to control a machine tool halfway across the world or across the block. Because with John, all his innovations were, were about, about keeping score. The, uh, he looked at cost and, and the cost and benefit and profitability is how we kept score against improvement, how we kept pushing that innovation. What we're doing here today in our partnership with Lake Tech and Lake, and Lake County Schools and our other manufacturing and business partners is continuing to develop the talent to push that innovation. Because now we're moving into this world of, of additive manufacturing. The ability to program one part individually out of a machine that could be running in your garage, if you had the money to do that. Or um, a machine that would be running that, that would be running in the back the backyard of GE making making uh, veins for a jet engine. That talent and innovation comes from the partnership that, that we have. Creating students that find different ways to solve problems, developing the base skills, science, math, and technology, which are still the constants to become successful construction and manufacturing to come back into our local workforce. I want to thank all of you for your support over the last few years and the partnerships that we've developed with each of you, and especially with Lake County Schools, uh, Lake, I'm sorry, Lake Technical College and Lake County Schools. 
as we continue to push the envelope for innovation to provide those skilled, productive workers to enter your manufacturing and construction workforce. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. 
side. In fact, we've never seen it cut across you know, the entire the entire sort of industry that values supply chain, a lot of which is outside the company, and a lot of which is other companies. And so we're beginning to see that take place um, piecemeal. Well, we had a speaker at a summit that we had back in May from from. Excuse me, can you use the microphone closer, please? The, the noise from the air conditioners is blocking it. Oh, okay. So you're getting wiped out by a chair. Is it, <laughs> is it me holding it up? Or is yes, it hold it up. Oh, okay. So here's this. Which one do you want? It's <laughs> one of the worst. Give me a stereo now. So the concern was I was turning into much. So when we think of it, industry 4.0, it's, it's, it's basically it's the application of all those digital technologies in the form of those nine key technologies that I'll talk about and the immersion of those technologies in our factory. And we have many sort of minor examples of embracing some of those technologies. But those are the technologies that are basically going to define, at least in manufacturing, probably in construction, uh, the degree of competitiveness that we have on board. And it's McKinsey study that they did, they would have this down to 14 companies around the world that they consider what they call lighthouse examples of embracing this technology. And many of these companies began that process 20 years ago. There was one company in the United States out of those thousands which were evenly distributed when they did their study that they thought met that test. These are the kind of core technologies. Uh, I've seen a lot of versions of this slide from a lot of different people. Generally, it's the nine technologies that you see here that outline uh, those aspects uh, that will, will, will more or less influence and transform industrial production as we know it today. <clears throat> the key one there is big data analytics. And I actually think this is going to be one of the biggest challenges. Uh, you know, when you look at manufacturing, it's an extremely data-rich environment. We have more data than we can possibly deal with. And you've seen a lot of big companies. I visited Johnson & Johnson, Mitsubishi, which is one of our central Florida companies, where they have massive amounts of data. What do you do with it? I did distill that data into something that's actionable. And so you're beginning to see the inclusion of some of these environments of data science and data scientists. In some cases, you know, with bigger companies, you're seeing that as become part of, of the, the, the core capabilities of the company. In smaller companies, you're beginning to see them look outside of their company to see how, how outside the resources could maybe help them. Another core technology which we've been talking about, I think, in my entire career is autonomous robots, but they're coming into the fore. You're beginning to see it. And, and when people talk about the workforce, there are a lot of the sky is going, this is going to wipe out the workforce, but it's not. Uh, in fact, in many cases where there's been the application of autonomous robots or cobots, what you've seen is that as an actual net increase in the productive capacity and reutilization of the workforce or an upskilling of the workforce uh, to handle that. Uh, so here's, here's, here's a kind of a nice picture of an example here of no people, cobots. And the cobots is generally the direction that you're seeing a lot of organizations going, except for those very large industrial applications. In order to implement a completely autonomous robot, you better be building lots of product at the same time. Another core technology is simulation, and we're sort of fortunate to be where we're at. This is sort of the center of the simulation universe, Central Florida. But you're seeing more and more incorporation of simulation and some of the decision making, uh, not just with design, but even with 
production layout where companies are creating sort of almost like a, a digital twin of the environment. We've seen it, and I know Diane teaches it, uh, where you know now within the CAD and CAM systems, you can actually simulate the production of that part, figure out that if you ran it that way, you would crash the machine and not actually crash the real machine. Uh, so the incorporation of those technologies, not just in that the design function, but in actually how the production process will work. And I say we're fortunate because this is the center of, of, of the simulation. This is probably the biggest country, concentration of simulation expertise in the country uh, around the University of, of Central Florida. Industrial Internet of Things, we hear about this. You know, we've got sensors for just about everything. Uh, and, and we can pretty much test everything. I mean, the amount of sensors that are in our phone is unbelievable. So, you know, we're seeing the application of that Industrial Internet of Things. To be able to access information about a machine, about a part, about a shipment, uh, in process. There's no limit to that. And this is another area that was in Central Florida we're beginning to sort of define ourselves a little bit. If you're familiar with the bridge facility down in Osceola County, and you're talking about semiconductor level sensor technology, and we hope that that will be a core, core sort of expertise within the region that will drive sort of that market. But the application of the Internet of Things is, is almost endless. And, and again, the more sensors you have, the more data, the data you're driving, the more you need to better understand how to analyze most of the data. So this is an example where some of the benefits of internet, uh, industrial and the, the things drivers are, and I imagine they're going to have copies of this, so we don't need to read through all this stuff. But. Another core technology is cybersecurity. I think we all kind of know about that. Uh, we know about it context of you know, city governments throughout Florida seem to be getting shut down to help ransom. That same kind of uh, uh, virus, if you will, is cre creeps into the production process. So you have industrial espionage, you've got people from other countries that are trying to hack into our production system, into our design, into our machines, and corrupt those designs. And this has become a really, really big issue with the Department of Defense and they will be having some core requirements coming up soon. I can't think of the name of the, of the standard that they'll be uh, imposing on their suppliers, but that's one of their key vulnerabilities, their industrial supply chain. So we'll be working with them, the MEPs across the United States will be working with them, in particular on how you uh, have uh, smaller firms deal with and realize the importance of this issue. I was with uh, one of the accounting firms, Clifton Larson and Ellen, Marnie Spence, who some of you might know, she's involved in the Manufacturing Association of Central Florida. And she talked to me about a company that got hit three times. You know, they never thought they were vulnerable. They got held up for ransomware, and they go, I guess we're in trouble. But since we got hit, we probably would never get it again. So that was their logic. They got to hit again. And, uh, you know, well, lightning struck us twice. Well, it's the odds they got hit a third time. So, you know, we're easy prey with a lot of the openness of our systems right now. And, and you know, as it relates to our businesses or governments or, or some of our security, national security, this is a real big issue. So if you're in the defense world, this is something you need to attend to as a requirement. It's coming. But if you're not, you really need to think about how you embrace this. The cloud, you know, a lot of the services that will come along with industry 4.0, we're pointing out, will come in the form of cloud technology, which means data storage and services outside the company. So we don't need to necessarily buy all these things and manage all these things. We work in a service environment now because we started in 2015. So people come in and say, Where's your server? And it's, I don't know, somewhere in Colorado, I guess. <laughs> But the use of that technology actually makes it more enabling to, to embrace uh, some of the core IT uh, that you, that's needed and some of the core capacities that you need for things like storage. When we talk about manufacturing data collection, you're getting into terabytes of storage, significant amounts of data. 
And that's not a poor competency necessarily that we need to bring in house and we need to use externally. Added manufacturing, you know, people talk about this, they tend to talk about three, but I add to additive composites, that's an additive manufacturing process, is what we pulled up. That's become a more and more important part of, of, of the actual production process as we get into metals and better understanding the engineering and the technologies that are behind it. You're seeing broader application of those technologies. To work, when you do anything on the space coast, that's a big issue. The adoption of that, particularly in rocket engine production and parts like that. You know, this is a technology that I, I think I saw for the first time in 1989. It looked like a piece of canvas that what this machine made. But this is a technology that's really beginning to become embraced beyond just a prototype form that a function test in the design function. It's actually a Augmented reality. You're beginning to see this more and more, particularly in, in the maintenance function. Uh, in, in aerospace, it's used pretty broadly, uh, where we're able to sort of, sort of live inside this, this computing environment, do maintenance perhaps with glasses on our face, where the instructors in front of us. Uh, and we have the latest, greatest version of everything that we need to know to fix that. That's become, is going to become more and more part of our learning environment, but also our maintenance and our production environment, where we're not having to go offline and research, you know, in a book somewhere, what, what we need to fix this particular problem. And finally, I think finally, horizontal and vertical integration. You know, you begin to hear people talk about the digital thread. But that idea of being able to carry that design throughout the production process, but also across all of our business systems within the company. Uh, you'll hear people talk about the digital twin or the digital thread. But in, in essence, it's when you take that business management system that you have and you begin to completely integrate it. So these technologies aren't just sitting on the factory floor, they're informing uh, purchasing, they're informing the engineering branch as to uh, what are some of the issues related to production or issues related to design in real time. <clears throat> and so these are the kind of areas where you're going to see that thread uh, present itself. And so when we talk about these technologies, we tend to think about them just on the factory floor, or maybe in the design branch. But the, the real value that people are trying to glean from Industry 4.0 is, is, is really the immersion of all those technologies across our business system and across our broader enterprise, our supply chains, our sector. So as I said, you know, this you know, brand that I think is that you can't learn everything about everything today, I, I, I hope you got at least an inkling about some of the technologies that are attached to this industry 4.0. A lot of people say it's a scary thing. A lot of people attach it to, oh, you know, the world, the future looks like we're going to just be completely automated and there's going to be no jobs and all these technologies are going to displace workers. And, you know, going back to the McKinsey report that I talked about, what they saw in those 14 lighthouse companies was a net increase of the workforce. What they saw was a culture within that company to upskill that workforce and to embrace these technologies such that, you know, that that job that they have may have gone away, but they did. There's a new job now that requires new skills and new approaches to the factory. Maybe they don't have their hands as closely in the production process, but they're standing outside of it, integrated with it, you know, whether it's cobots or whether that's in how they manage uh, the digital enterprise that sits behind that production process. So the story that the takeaway from that McKinsey when they when they spoke at our summit was, you know, the workforce is not going away, but it has to upskill. And so a lot of what you're hearing and seeing in operations like Dynas really begins to talk to where these not necessarily where these jobs are today, but where these workers need to be tomorrow. So I'll put myself up there because I probably don't have my fifty but I hope it is made a point. So. <laughs>
Um, next, we're super excited to have Debbie Rodriguez from IBO Central Florida come and share some of her secrets. I'm also going to start with video. <laughs>
in the right direction, and not just, just Lori, but a lot, of, a lot of different people in this community. Uh, I, I have the privilege that Lori sits on the Ideal Board, so I get to have a lot of relationships beyond just, just this. Uh, but if you really look at uh, what Lake County wants to do, I mean, we're starting to talk about having a uh, middle school camp for, for middle schoolers. So you're looking, because we have to touch these students way at the very beginning. As soon as they're starting to figure out what path they want to go down. And I don't think we've done a very good job as a community or as an industry to tell them, hey, it's okay to be a blue-collar worker. I mean, we were founded by blue-collar workers. And so we're trying to change the conversation and the, and the look of what, what we as an industry look like. So I'm very excited about the partnership that we have with Lake County and continue to have with Lake County, um, obviously with Lake Tech, but having the IPAP Carpentry Apprenticeship Program, it's piloting right now, the very first one. Uh, we have 20 students, we started with 28. As everybody knows, any apprenticeship program uh, definitely will, will fall from the beginning numbers to where they are today, but we have a pretty stable group. Uh, we're also looking at piloting this in Osceola County as well, but we, we certainly look at the next. Uh, Career Source is a very big component of funding, uh, having the curriculum built, getting approved by the state of Florida, and there were several people involved. I actually have a lot of my board here today. Uh, so there's, it's really a community effort. And it, everybody asks me, well, well, why not bigger? Why not you know, Florida? Or why not the U.S.? And, and for me, it has to be driven by the community. And I think when you, when you start to pull that out of a, a community driven, it doesn't necessarily work. Meaning, you have to have a vested interest in the industry and in the education sector to come together to make things like this work. And if you try to become too big, so we started small. We started in Central Florida, and we have six of the local school districts that are part of iBuild, which in turn now is part of iCap. And as we continue to grow, we just we see it. We already see it blossoming into North Florida. We see it blossoming into the Gulf Coast. Uh, but it has to be driven by the community. It has to be driven by the leaders sitting in this room and the leaders in the construction and the education sector truly partnering together to, to make it work. So, um, you know, I'm very grateful to Lake Tech for inviting me today and talking about what I is doing uh, for the last couple of years. And we're very excited to be starting to partner some with the Manufacturing Association because, to be quite honest with you, we deal with the same, the same skill set. It's just a different environment. And so I encourage you, if you're not involved, um, I build meets once a month. Uh, we're doing a lot of connecting the classrooms with the industry. We're doing a lot of things locally that are truly changing the mindsets of truly the parents, because you have to change it from the parents' view. And I was grateful that my parents didn't necessarily talk about college a lot, even though they wanted better for me, and I'm not quite sure what the better for me was, but everybody says it's college. And I'm like, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that I like school that much, so I think I'm going to do that route. Um, but there's nothing wrong with working hard to get to where you are. And I don't know that going to, and I also, I turned away a full ride to Florida to, to just go into the workforce because I, I didn't want to go to school, I wanted to go to work. And so uh, we talk about that and success is, measured by, success is measured by the lives that you change day in and day out. It's not measured by your bank account, at least for myself. It's not measured by your bank account. It's not measured by your accomplishments because at the end of the day, the lives that you change is, is to me, where your true success lies, and so that is an of paper for me. So I hope that you all continue to support Lake Tech because it's a phenomenal, the growth that they're going to have in the next year or two is, is exciting to see. We're excited to be partnered with them in the ICAP program and continue to building some great things in Lake, Lake County. So um, obviously the Lake County School Board is also part of iBuild. Uh, we have an iBuild Invitational every year, which I'm sure that Eventually, we'll have it in Lake County as well. Right now, it's currently in Orange County. It's a skills competition, uh, a job fair, and a signing day. So it's really exciting. We had our first one last year. We'll have our second one uh, in 2020. So uh, anything that you need to ask about iBuild, you can look us up on it's, uh, you know, our website and all of that. So thank you so much for your time and, and looking forward to getting to know some of you. Thanks.
those jobs in manufacturing and construction. And so I'm very um, thankful to be with you this morning, Erica Green. Thank you so much for inviting me to the Galloway Lake folks. I'm Pam Neighbors from Career Source Central Florida. I want to do two things this morning. I want to tell you a little bit about Career Source Central Florida and what we're doing here in your community and how we connect talent to opportunity, um, how we inspire uh, both business and career seekers on their journey of finding an opportunity and finding um, a skilled worker. And then I also want to tell you about our um, work in apprenticeship models, like the ILO model, but also beyond the construction um, traditional idea of apprenticeship. So those are the two things I'm going to do. And this is the Okay. Yeah. 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 Yay. <laughs> okay. So Career Source Central Florida. We believe we are career sources who inspire people, transform business, and elevate community. Works out really good with the elevated business name, right? So uh, Career Source Central Florida is the Regional Workforce Development Board here in the five-county region of Central Florida. We are the second largest career source board in the state of Florida. There are 24 of us, and we are one of 600 plus in the country. We are tasked with doing just this, connecting the business community and opportunities to the talent and upskilling that talent, getting that talent to market, making sure businesses are competitive and productive, and that workers have the opportunity to be self-sustaining and prosperous. So uh, we actually, some of the, um, the kind of myths about career source or the workforce system or the employment service, you might have some maybe nagging governmental kind of ideas about what we do. But I want to assure you that actually uh, the workforce of the 21st century is not your employment service of the 20th century. So first of all, the niche market that we serve, and by the way, in Lake County, we served almost 5,000 career seekers last year, is really the working age population, 22 to 44. They have a high school diploma at least. They have some additional training. And they have a will to work, but they're not making enough. They're really not making enough to sustain themselves or their families. We also serve many businesses. Here in Lake County, we served close to 400 businesses last year. And those businesses are primarily small businesses, many of those I've met in this room. This is our tutorial, if you will, of how we do our work. But really, we have a dual customer. So customers are for us both businesses and people looking for opportunities. And so we really want to um, be in mind that we are never serving just one customer base. It really is. You know, one lifts the other. We understand what the business environment and need is. We know what the intelligence is about what companies need in talent, like construction workers who are skilled, for example. We have to craft partnerships. I'm having a little bit of trouble here. Are you too close? Um, with our particularly education partners, I am so fortunate in Lake County to have a great partner in Dr. Cullen. Lake Tech College and Dr. Stan Sador at Lake Sumter State College. Actually, here in Lake County, our Career Source Center, our physical presence to connect business to career seekers, is right on the Lake Sumter State College um, uh, location on uh, uh, 441 right, uh, in Leesburg. So we're we just a brand new location. We'd love to have you all visit. And then implement talent strategies, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. For career seekers, what we want to do is, at any point along their career journey, get them competitive and skilled for work. So they might be entry level, they might be young adults just starting a career, they might be people transitioning from one opportunity to another, perhaps they were laid off, perhaps they need a better job to get past that $15 an hour mark, or perhaps they are individuals who, uh, uh, unlike me, are retired early and actually want to do some additional work with their second or encore career. And so we really need to engage them in ways that make them competitive for the market. We also want to develop them through the partnerships with our education partners, but most importantly, through our partnerships with business. And so we do that through not just traditional kinds of classroom or skill training, but also through internships, on-the-job opportunities, customized training at a business many different kinds of business models depending on the need of the business and the individual. 
And then craft the right fit that is what it's all about, right? We also focus on the growing sectors in the five county region. And we're talking about two of our high growth sectors this morning, manufacturing and construction. And Debbie said, you know, the reality is, is they do blend over in terms of the skill base that you need. You need individuals with a good work ethic, you need individuals who can problem solve, make decisions, work on a team, who can do math, um, at least computational math, um, who can think creatively and perhaps somewhat abstractly. So depending on the kind of skill inside of construction or inside of manufacturing organization, we know that those skills are very needed and necessary in these industries. We also, of course, um, support the hospitality industry, but we're interested in where people have career growth opportunities, like culinary arts, for example. Healthcare, self-evident, the largest number of work uh, with business we did last year was in the healthcare industry. But interestingly enough, there's a lot of construction going on in healthcare, so there's a blend. So there are actually specialties even within, I just learned this morning, in the construction industry for building healthcare facilities. So we actually have the privilege of being able, as I mentioned before, to work from physical locations. We have five career centers that are those hubs where we connect business to talent. We also, though, take our talented uh, staff, and by the way, I have several staff in the room this morning, and when I finish my presentation, I'm gonna have them all wave. Uh, my business manager, business consultants here that you'll wanna get to know at, the, um, at some portion of uh, this morning. But we also embed them, or get them connected directly to our partners, like Lake Tech College, or Lake Summer State College, or in Orange County, we actually have people that work downtown now in the new Valencia Center um, that is in the downtown campus of UCF and Valencia. We, we provide a lot of different services to other career seekers' side. Most importantly, we, we look at working with career seekers and businesses from a consulting perspective. So we want to understand what you need, not necessarily give you a list of what we have. So we're working with those career seekers, we do assessment, determine what they um, may be able to be successful at, and then craft an opportunity for them, either for traditional training on the job or any kind of a way to get them more skilled and more competitive to market. Um, for businesses, I will tell you the bulk of the work we do is in the recruitment, outreach, screening, and um, getting talent small businesses, we can act as their human resources department. Many small businesses, you know, the president is also the HR department and the marketing manager, right? So we can actually be an extension of that human resources department for businesses throughout Lake County. And then this is a little bit of what we did last year. So we actually put into training close to 400 career leaders. We, um, we know that so far, many are still training because they do go into programs that are about a year or, or less in length, um, or if they're in on the job training, maybe six months. But we know so far that 220 of them have gone to work in an average wage of just under $14 an hour. And businesses, I mentioned before, about 350 with 8% in construction and 20% manufacturing, which by the way, manufacturing um, percentage has come up over the last few years. And this is just Lake County. Across the region, we serve 42,000 individuals and 5,000 businesses. And we do that not alone, but with many partners. And we also work, um, in particular with, out here in Lake County, the Community Action Agency to wrap around services to ensure that people are ready for work when we bring them to market and get them in front of a business. So apprenticeships. How many of you are thinking that an apprenticeship is four years long and it's uh, primarily union based. How many of that thought? Like, no, no, well good, this is great because apprenticeships are not the apprenticeship of your grandfather or grandmother, right? Apprenticeship actually is really um, much like a work and learning opportunity. And in our um, world, we talk about big A and little A apprenticeships. So 
big A apprenticeships are apprenticeships that actually are registered through the state and the U.S. Department of Labor. And they have a curriculum that is approved and uh, documented, and there are certificates that come as a part of it. And there's a sequence of learning and working. And by the way, it's not necessarily as um, Debbie talked about in a traditional union shop, in a marriage shop as well. And it's also not just construction. I think that's the big thing about apprenticeship these days in the United States is that apprenticeship is really taking on as an opportunity to learn and work at the same time, and not necessarily in what we might think of as trade trades, but in many, many different kinds of occupations across the growing sectors in our region. So it prepares for business the team that they need. It can be customized, and probably most important is people are earning while they're learning. Right? They have an opportunity, you know, these days one of the things that we struggle with when we put people into traditional training is how are they going to just basically take off work for nine months or 12 months? They can't. Most of them are number of 2244 have families, need to support those families. And so apprenticeship is a great model to help people to earn while they are learning what they do. For business, it's got all kinds of opportunities and perks. Most importantly, it has the great, uh, the great uh, benefit of retaining employees. Employees that feel invested in over time, shown in many, many different studies, stay with business. And one of the key things I hear from businesses these days, oh my gosh, I can't believe this person has ghosted me. Do you know what ghosting is? <laughs> has anybody been ghosted? Excuse me, I have been ghosted. Um, so ghosting is when an employee just suddenly doesn't show up. You're like calling them, or they go, right? Or they don't show up. You hire them and they never show up. <laughs> so um, retention yeah, is a key issue these days, and apprenticeship opportunities can offer a, a retention um, for um, The key components of an apprenticeship are business involvement, structured on the job training, component technical instruction usually, a wage increase, so there is progression, and a certificate of completion, a measure of competency and skill. Apprentice Florida, the Career Source Florida, and the Department of Economic Opportunity, and the governor are all very excited and supporting the apprenticeship model in our state because they know the benefit and they also know the need that our businesses have. And so uh, this year, there are $3.5 million available through career source boards or through education providers or through businesses to expand apprenticeship models across the state. I want to tell you about some of our traditional apprenticeship models. I won't go back into um, the iBuild model, but we're very proud of our partnership with iBuild and Orange Technical College and soon Lake Technical College. And actually, Debbie, your numbers are better than mine. 28 recruited, I said 26, you said 20 in training, and I have 18, so great, me, take a note of that. <laughs> <laughs> but we are really excited. This is an opportunity to actually train individuals in carpentry, a skill that they can use across many different disciplines inside of the construction industry. Um, we also have, in a traditional sense, a way that we have supported now over the last couple of years, almost 70 electricians. Joint Apprentice Training Council. That is the trade union for electricians in the Central Florida area. Interestingly enough, we don't pay for the training. The actual JATC does that. We pay in the second year for apprentices their boots, their work tools, their transportation support, so that we are sure that they actually are successful and complete that electrician program. And any idea what an electrician makes? After their second year? Want to guess? 20 at least, probably around 26. So, excellent, excellent opportunity. And how about the journey of the They can write their own ticket, right? Um, and then finally, we also last year uh, merit, um, again, a group of businesses, roofing businesses. We created a roofing apprenticeship. We have many, many roofing companies. And um, unfortunately, or fortunately for them, there are many, many roofing opportunities in Central Florida after the hurricane seasons we've had the last couple of years. Not wood. We don't have any this year, right? It's not over yet. 
Um, but uh, we had a roofing apprenticeship that actually put 18 individuals into training. And they are uh, almost all working in the roofing industry. But what about in a, in a sector that isn't necessarily construction? So in this last couple of years, we actually had a really great partnership with Seminole State College and the Hartford. The Hartford is an insurance company near and dear to my heart because I moved here seven years ago from Hartford, where the Hartford is a headquarter. But the Hartford actually has uh, a, a, a office up in Lake Mary, and they were really struggling in the fact that they couldn't find benefits analysts at the same level of skill and education that they had had in the past, particularly as the labor market had improved. They um, were, before, looking for bachelor degree individuals fresh out of college that would come to them and be benefits analysts for about, mm, starting wages around $48,000 a year. Um, but guess what? They couldn't find them. So they actually came to Central State College in Resource Center in Florida and asked if we would look at a model they had created in other parts of the country where they um, focused on targeting individuals who were working towards a two-year program as benefits analysts, and they would actually hire them and work at the same time. And I think I have a little video to tell you a little bit about that program, this, this video. Is there a video there? Yeah. Nope. All right. I'm going to tell you about the program. <laughs> OK, so. Uh, So um, the program started a couple years ago. Actually, what we did was we partnered with the college and looked at students that were already um, in perhaps their first year looking at opportunities like in the finance area or insurance area. And we did a lot of work and assessment in identifying students who were interested in this work and could be successful. 29 students so far have uh, participated in the program. Five have actually now achieved their associate's degree um, seven more will graduate this coming spring, but really what's key to this kind of a program is every single one of them are employed by the Hartford. And they're employed at those wages really starting more around $50,000 a year. What an amazing opportunity this model provides for us to look at different kinds of apprenticeship models. And this kind of apprenticeship model can be used in many other different sectors throughout manufacturing as well as construction opportunities. We're very proud. So I'm sorry that I didn't get to show you that video because it really has the students talking about what the program and the new opportunity has meant to them. But we will send it to you. So um, how we can help and how the state also is supporting us to think about setting up new apprenticeships is really from the state's perspective that for a registered apprenticeship it takes about 30 days. They have actually marshaled their resources to be more responsive to the market. And so we're working with them. And as I mentioned, there really is a great return on investment in uh, businesses coming together either from an IBIC model or um, looking at an on-site model. Interestingly enough, earlier this year I had an opportunity to look at a couple models that um, were first pioneered just a couple, like three years ago when the federal government decided that it wanted to promote apprenticeships, both in culinary arts where uh, frontline chefs were going to um, different levels of chef on the job. A um, great little place called Duke's. If you ever been to Honolulu, they have an apprenticeship model operating there. And also with respiratory therapy, where um, the hospitals in Honolulu actually were able to create respiratory therapy apprenticeship programs that helped the medical um, organizations maintain their workforce. Because what was happening is uh, respiratory therapists would get through their uh, second year of program, two year program usually. They would go on an internship in the spring. It was usually unpaid. And the hospitals would love them, but then when they got done with the internship, they would go somewhere else. They'd go to the highest bidder for their, for their job, and they had no loyalty to the hospital. So what they found is that the model actually created that loyalty and that retention. So apprenticeship works. So I've said a lot. I probably went a little bit over here. Yeah. I'm actually right on time. Should I see if there are any questions? Or I one or two. One or two. Does anyone have any questions? No, I 
have stunned them into silence. <laughs> um, yes? Uh, President Trump announced his, his apprenticeship uh, initiatives, and how is that rolled down to your level? It is. It is part of the resources that I've, I've spoken about. And the, the pilot projects I talked about that actually three years ago started in um, Hawaii, actually got a grant for the dollars that the administration put out. Every year those projects go out. Um, so there are some projects that are operating around our state. And I think we have an opportunity to really learn from those projects, not just in construction and manufacturing, but in other um, sectors that are growing in our economy. So great question. We're going to keep our eye on the dollars that are available through both our federal and our state resources. Well, if not, I would definitely, oh, first, I, last thing I do want to do is I have several members of Career Source Central Florida here with Amy Kunin, is our Chief Operations Officer. Wade, she makes it all happen, so she's really the person to talk to. Um, Jesse Buxton is right here. He's our Senior Business Manager. And then we have really do the work, Terrence Hightower, <laughs> working in our construction sector, our business consultant, Yolanda Green. Where is she? Yolanda Green. She is our business consultant for Lake and Sumter County. And did I miss anybody? No. And of course, oh wait, Gustavo. Wait, Gustavo, wait. Gustavo is our career center manager for our Lake and Sumter uh, office up there on the Lake Sumter State College campus. And I would be remiss if I didn't also say a special thanks to Greg Bellavo over here, who is our former board secretary, um, who actually has been on the board up until this year for the last seven years that I've been here, and has been very supportive as a business here in the county in ensuring that groups of Central Florida services are available to businesses and career seekers in Lake. So with that, I thank you very much and look forward to talking with you after. Uh, 
technicians. So you'll see a lot of people there that are in this room, except maybe the Department of Education. And um, we have a long laundry list of desired outcomes there, and not much focus on the uh, technical training or education anywhere in the country for a number of years. So we win that uh, everybody goes to four year college mode and um, the Associate of Science kinds of programs were um, kind of overlooked as were the vocational programs at the high schools for quite a number of years, maybe a few decades. And um, so we set out to kind of unify the program in the state of Florida to make sure we met industry needs, build a community of practice among the programs and the, the partners in the, in the schools, um, reach out to the high schools, so every college has several high school partners that they work with, some in different enrollment, what, different activities, different ways across the state. So lots of um, lofty goals um, way back um, when we started years ago. And today um, we have a pretty um, linked uh, community of practice. We do it through a lot of social media, we do it through face-to-face -face meetings, um, all in the effort to keep our programs um, up to date with the uh, industry, what they need, what the high schools are doing, what the Department of Education is doing, um, lots of um, activities going on between colleges, starting new programs amongst themselves. They really don't need me anymore, but um, it's a great, uh, it's a great group. And um, if you're really interested, you can come to the Technology Forum tomorrow. It'll be at some Central State College. We'll be meeting for uh, Thursday and Friday of this week. There'll be 55 people there from the colleges around the state that offer this uh, program. One of our great outreach pieces uh, to add to this, it's added a lot of blue to our community, has been the um, celebrating Manufacturing Day of month. So um, after a number of years, we um, put together this nice big graphic of what, what all the curriculum and the different pathways that we have. We're not going to go through this, but it does offer opportunities for different industry sectors in different parts of the country, or in different parts of the state, to uh, specialize in that second year of their um, engineering technology program. That's the umbrella degree that they get. We made articulated um, pathways, state articulation agreements for a number of uh, industry certifications, including the MSSC, which is kind of at the core level. Some upper level certifications are also um, articulated down in, in the bottom, so in the second year of the program. So lots of lots of stuff going on, lots of sharing with these kinds of programs, and lots of ways for people, uh, workforce, uh, people in the workforce who want to get a different job, students in high school to en enroll in the program and um, work their way through, get a good job. We do have across the state 100% uh, placement, and the placement. Oh, let's see, we'll just back up a minute. So this is kind of our, our quick history lesson. The three bold schools start at um, back in 2006. Notice the school where I, where I, the center actually lives in Hillsboro wasn't among the first three, but came along shortly after that. And then today we're um, in 23 colleges. And from those 23 colleges, many will be there, um, I said tomorrow, and the next day across the state, with the statewide enrollment, just about 2,000 students. Now the students don't um, go through, well, many of them are part-time, so they have different different rates of making their way through the, the programs. So I won't give you any of those other kinds of statistics at this point, but many of them graduating every year, just not in the, often in a two-year cycle. Uh -oh. Okay, so we like to look at this map. Um, skip one. Oh, well. So here's a little bit about our, our, our meeting that we're having tomorrow. So we got to stop here on our way over there. Um, and we'll have people from all of these different uh, organizations present to work on uh, curriculum. We've just done a, finished our three year review, but in the process of doing that three year review, um, this is at the state level. So we vetted by um, the Department of Education. We have started addressing the very things that Kevin talked about just uh, moments ago. But we're, what are we going to do in Industry 4.0? Where does it fit in our, in our programs? So we'll be talking about that actually tomorrow. And we have a draft um, outline of what, what things we need to add to the two-year technician degree program that addresses the 
does for the industry in our state? What are their partners telling them they need to know? So I'll we'll start here. I'm a slow learner. <laughs> Yeah, it's 
start integrating into our curriculum and looking at what, what will the, the two-year degree graduate look like in the future? Will there be more common skill sets across the next industry? Um, or will there still be really specialized, more independent degree programs? So here's some of the, the takeaways we have from um, our, our site visits right now. So this is a, a technician. Um, so you have to read a couple of these and I'll let you read some. Nothing has changed except the tool set and the speed of response to technology changes. There's a guy who thinks we just got to work a lot faster, and make the product faster, the machines are running faster. You can monitor a PLC from the office and tell when a machine is about to break down. That's, a huge, that's huge for preventative maintenance. So from a higher level um, person, a supervisor, uh, the working technicians, there are fewer problems with the new PLCs, but the problems are more significant when something wrong happens. So that tells us right away, troubleshooting, problem solving are much more important. The machines are more complicated, they're more connected. Um, we saw the connection to the, to the cloud, they're connected to each other. Lots more um, opportunities for uh, investigative work, trying to figure out where things have gone wrong. And then from um, middle management, so this might be the floor manager, the shift manager for the entire, the entire facility. I love this guy. We had 14 of our technicians migrate to engineering positions um, because they they upskilled their workforce and then. Please use the microphone. They upscaled their workforce and, and were able to move into an uh, um, engineering, uh, engineering position within the company. And there's always room for lots of change. So. Lots coming down from them. So we, we've done like, some, uh, a number of visits. We've had a number of focus groups um, with industry, with the educators, um, locally, around the country. And right now, we're marketing the things that people are telling us in these three categories. Uh, data, we've already kind of gone into that. We understand that that's going to be important. What we don't know is how much the person on the floor is really going to have to interact with um, that data. Is it going to be data from like they get now, one machine? Is it, they just going to have to look at more data from more individual machines and troubleshoot from that? So a lot more investigation on that. The advanced digital literacy is anything from the Ethernet connections between the machines, between the machines and the cloud, cybersecurity issues, how much did the technicians need to know about that, and also the, all the automation and robotics that are coming into play uh, slowly but surely across the country. And lastly, the business knowledge, just having uh, the workforce understand more about having that we're making a product and that everything they do has consequences down the line. That if they make a mistake or something goes down for in their area, that there's significant consequences um, for the company and maybe for themselves. So some of that has come up on a regular basis. So here's our, this is our uh, website for this, for this particular project, technicians.org. And uh, we do have a, a number of podcasts on these kind of new trending topics. I think the very next one is going to be on the digital transformation specialist, but it wasn't me. Um, but uh, lots of great topics if you want a little bit about one of these kinds of technologies or these new technologies coming into different parts of the workforce in different industry sectors. And then we also have a, a blog forum that's um, covering the same types of topics. So here's a, the questions I'll uh, leave you with that we're working on right now. Um, I'm thinking about a lot. Uh, what does it What does it mean for the, the technicians? And what are they going to have to learn? What are they going to have to do? And likewise, what are they not going to have to learn? What are they not going to have to do anymore? What are we training them for today that they won't maybe need in the future? So we have room and time to to add the new technologies and the new um, information to their, to their studies. Working so far, I'm fine with that one. <laughs> and I, I did bring a few flyers around the table back there that are talk about this uh, future work project. So if you want one of those, you can make them up.
now we're excited to welcome Don Buckner. He has been So next we have a dynamic duo. Oh my gosh, first I thought was cool. So we have Dan Roma coming from Romac Building Supply. I apologize, I got excited and jumped ahead. It's the music. It's Ted Nugent. <laughs> So uh, I'm supposed to talk about uh, uh, recruiting and retaining employees. Uh, I'm with Romat Building Supply. Uh, we're here in Central Florida. have a, a little over 300 employees, mostly blue collar. So I'm going to focus uh, mostly on that. And uh, to start with, just be completely transparent. I certainly don't have this figured out. We struggle with turnover. I'm sure just like everyone else. So if you've got some ideas, I'd appreciate you share with me later too. Um, but before I get into some of the specific things we're doing, I think it's a, a good idea to talk about from a big picture. So I'm sure many of you have seen the different surveys that are out there about why employees leave. And while they all vary a little bit, uh, they are pretty consistent in, in two things. One is that uh, paying benefits are never the, one, uh, the number one reason. That's generally top number five. And I think that's, you know, with the tight labor market, paying benefits are pretty much table stakes. If you're not competitive there, you're not going to hire the person to start with. Um, but then at the top of the list are, are generally kind of squishier things like uh, like appreciation, recognition, uh, sense of purpose. And so one of the studies I read recently showed that 79% uh, of employees who quit their jobs claimed that a lack of appreciation was one of the major reasons that they left. Um, but also, uh, having spoken in, in Lake County with different boards and stuff, uh, we're a little bit of an older demographic, and so when we talk about appreciation, the kind of feedback that I normally hear is, well, when you say employees care about appreciation, what you're really talking about is millennials. Millennials there, they care about appreciation, and they maybe don't matter as much, because they're, they're not going to stay, they're just going to leave, right? Well, that's, that's actually flaw. Um, millennials don't leave. Uh, in fact, uh, the median tenure for employees today, it's almost double what it was 35 years ago, right? 4.6 years is the median tenure versus 2.5 in 1983. Um, what is true is that young people do tend to leave a little bit earlier, but that's been true. It was true for the baby boomers, it was true for uh, Generation X, and it's true for the younger millennials. But so we push back, and you think, well, those are different millennials than the ones I experienced. And the millennials I experienced, uh, they're, they're snowflakes, uh, they're, they're very entitled, uh, and they don't really want to work hard. And so even if we believe that, right, so you can, you can believe that, maybe that's been your experience, the reason you should care is, one, if you're a baby boomer, it's your fault that you create those. And uh, <laughs> two, the millennials, and full disclosure, I am barely a millennial, we're about to be the majority. So, 2017, we were 35% of the workforce. Sometime next year, we're going to cross over 50%. And so, while the stereotype of millennials may be that we're entitled snowflakes, we may be a little bit of stereotype. Probably not, not entirely true, but of baby boomers, right? We think that you're wasteful, you're greedy, you're bureaucratic, you don't like change. And so, either you can figure out how to deal with us, or when we're the majority, we might just suck. And then I want to get to some specific things, but because we may have some baby boomers who still don't like this, and that's okay. When you leave here, you can go to every baby boomer's safe place, right? That's Facebook. Everyone knows baby boomer's Facebook, which of course was created for you by somebody else. So uh, you have that. But uh, some things that we do, right? So blue collar, a lot of people think about appreciation for employees. Um, that means putting a foosball or letting people work from home. And, that doesn't really work too well with a $15 an hour guy. If, if I let him work for, from home, that, that, that might not ever come back. It'll go to me. But, um, so, some things we do. Uh, and, and they don't all cost money. So we pay, we pay our employees every week and instead of bi-weekly. And I thought that was absolutely insane until I went to a high school job fair and I had multiple kids come up and say, Bro, man, aren't you that employee? You're that place that pays every week. So that's so not people who pay a paycheck. That's a big deal. Um, we do... We have a program where we'll offer a free cash advance of twenty dollars, so that we then give it to another week in cash and take it out of the picture. Um, you know, for most people in the room, that sounds probably crazy, but if you don't have money for lunch, that's a big deal, uh, and people are more likely to stay. Uh, 
information. Um, you know, we do a quick morning meeting uh, in small groups every morning where we talk, ask employees, you know, what are your ideas? Uh, what problems did you have the day before? And you know, do you have any ideas for improvement? Very short, less than five minutes, but letting them know that we care about what they have to say. And we get a lot of really great ideas that way. Um, but I think daily is important. Um, we have a, a company assistance fund. So the company started, we state the initial uh, amount of money, and then employees can have up to, I think it's $3 a week of their paycheck. Go into that, it's entirely run by employees. So if you're an employee, um, no executives are on that board. Um, you can go to that, that assistance fund, people say, hey, you know, I have this, uh, this health emergency, or I, can't, I, I need money to make my electric payment, and they can decide whether they just give them the money to structure it as a, as a, as a repayment, however they want to do, but it's, it's another place they can go. And then finally, uh, health insurance, I said benefits are, are kind of table stakes, but uh, I don't know if any of you saw that came out recently, the average cost for family floor health insurance, this includes employee pay, is now over $20,000 a year. So it's a huge, huge number. So what's happening, I'm sure uh, my company, just like others, we're going to high deductible plans. But that means employees got to shoulder more and more of that burden, so that's tough on them. So we're trying something this year that uh, if you've ever heard of direct primary care, we still offer a regular health plan, but if you're on a high deductible plan, we actually have a, a doctor that employees can see for free. They, they're at our location twice a month, or they can go to their location as telemedicine, but at no cost to the employee, because we're finding out that employees on a high deductible health plan weren't using any health care because they couldn't afford to go see a doctor even before they got their deductible. So we think that's going to be uh, a bigger and bigger deal. But I think really it's just being uh, cognizant that employees that want to be recognized, they want to feel good about their job, and they want to make care. And so just consistently trying to find things like that, and, and uh, knowing that millennials are, whether like it or not, we're going to be a big, big, big part of the workforce, and uh, so people might have to make some changes to accommodate that. But uh, all in all, it, it's, uh, it's going to be good. Thanks. Factors of employment. 
And so we have um, employers partnering with our office and employee jobs at a living wage, you know, more than minimum wage, certainly more than 10 bucks an hour. They tend to do much better on probation. So, so we have great partners with career schools, Goodwill, Job Center, and Lake Technical College. Um, and so uh, we started brainstorming. I was fortunate enough to meet Laura here. And, uh, and we started talking about a probation award program. And so I'm going to let Lori tell you a little bit more about that and show you some screens. But we, did, we, uh, we identified some probationers who were in that niche group where they were having employability problems and needed some skills and uh, they were uniquely uh, appropriate for this initiative. So our goal is to uh, help make them law abiding citizens and productive members of society and pay taxes like all of us do. So that's what this is all about. Good afternoon. Or good morning. Oh my gosh, I'm getting all that. Okay, so um, I am Lori Bryant, and uh, as Tony said, Erica got us together to talk about the probation work. And the first program we decided on was an intro to construction and technology course. So uh, that course started on September the 10th, and the last day will be next Thursday, October 24th. So in this class, uh, it's about seven weeks. The students have an opportunity to earn their OSHA 10 certification, their forklift certification, and then we, uh, they have the opportunity to work with the city of Leesburg to renovate some apartments. So I'm going to show you a few pictures of the students. Uh, I do want to say thank you to Career Source Central Florida who uh, provided scholarships to most of the students uh, so that they could attend this course, and thank you to Ivy Central Florida for also providing a scholarship for a student. So many of these students, they're, they're seven, they're seven students in. Some of them had not used hand tools and power tools before, uh, and that was very interesting. This is their first project that they did. Um, the lesson here was measuring and the compensating for the blade width. So the students made this, which is a, a stand to hold their PPE. So the little cubbies hold their, their hard hats and glasses and then they, they put a hook, or they're supposed to put a hook on the bottom to hang their vest. So this was their first project that they did. Am I doing something wrong that this is cutting out? I'm just mm -hmm. cutting out. So the students had an opportunity to frame a wall, and it's short, but this summer we had a construction camp for our high school students, and they built these little short walls, so we decided to put some drywall on the little short walls. They're building on the boxes. Not sure what we're going to do with those yet, Dr. Cole. The students are also going to make an herb raised a raised herb garden for the culinary students to grow some fresh um, vegetables and herbs. That should probably start tonight. Construction. Um, one of the interesting things that the students had the chance to do this not in any of these pictures is use a nail gun. So that was uh, pretty exciting to watch <laughs> <laughs> from outside the room. <laughs> These are pictures from this Saturday where the students went to the Miss Pa apartment in Leesburg. And they started with a, a blank floor. And throughout the day, they tiled the floor. They demoed some drywall. So here you can see the students on the right putting the tile down. More demolition. And this is the final, the, it's not finished because there's no gravel on it. This is what the students had the opportunity. So the instructor thought they'd just be out there a few hours. They were scheduled to be there seven. Um, the city of Leesburg said, oh, I'm going to have a couple of hours of work. But the guys had so much fun that the instructor had to say, okay, time to go. So they were out there, they had a great time, and they'll be back working with the city of Leesburg this summer, I mean, this Saturday. I will say that the students will be finishing on Saturday, so if there are any construction companies interested in hiring any of the students, it would be great for you to provide that opportunity. Uh, I do want to in advance thank Romac and the Commercial Contractors Association for providing opportunities for the students. So I'm going to transition a little bit from construction into corporate and community training since this is um, Construction and Manufacturing Summit. So I am the Corporate and Community Training Coordinator at Lake Tech. So my responsibility is to provide short courses, customized training, workforce development training, for whoever wants it or needs it. So we have purchased uh, Mechatronics um, trainers, and I'm going to show you pictures of those in a couple of slides. Uh, and we're going to be able to provide workforce development.
development training for your employees or again anyone who wants it. And it will be available in the spring. So the good thing about this training is it's customized. So you can choose your date, your time, your location, the duration, whatever the needs of your employees are. And our options are um, that you can do everything at Lake Tech. There's a curriculum and then there's hands-on work with the trainers. So you can do it all at Lake Tech. You can do the instruction on your site and then come into Lake Tech and do the hands-on. Maybe our least favorite option, but it will be available, is for the students to do the online curriculum anywhere because it's going to be it's internet-based training and then come into Lake Tech and do the hands-on. But again, the good thing is it's wherever, wherever you are, whatever your needs are as a company. So Dr. Culpepper showed the beautiful picture of our Center for Advanced Manufacturing. This is in the lab. So this is our, our area with our Megatronics equipment that's already there in the lab. So the training that we provide, we have a fluid power training. So we have hydraulics. I'm not going to read that. We'll send this out. Hydraulics and pneumatics. We have a programmable logics or PLC trainer that we'll also be able to train our students on. The focus on this is primarily ladder logic and not the physical connection. We have a motor control station and two electrical trainers as well. If you are interested in any of this training for your employees, I'll be glad for you to come and visit the campus and talk to me about it and try to get some of that training done for your um, employees. In addition to the mechatronics training that we offer, corporate and community training also provides training in these areas and more. And I put the ask for it because, you know, really if there's any type of training need uh, out there, then I'll try, to, I'll try to meet that need. I was recently contacted by one of the municipalities about providing ADA compliance training. And so for the past two Fridays and now this Friday, I will be providing training for two of the municipalities in the area on making their work and Adobe Acrobat documents ADA compliant. So um, a lot of things we can do again to ask for it. I invite you to visit latech.org under corporate and community training. There's an area under customized training for you to enter specific requests for training. There's a continuing education area where you can see the courses that we already have scheduled. And then there's an e-learning area where you can take online courses if you want. So please visit the website. Come give me a visit. That's all I have. Thank you both. I love the idea of us being able to engage our probationers and giving them opportunities and being able to then embrace them in our local businesses. So it's always exciting to hear that. And then, of course, Lake Tech is always offering what you need when you need it. I just made that up. So. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I'm excited now to invite Dr. Levine. She is with Lake Sumter State College, and she's going to talk about some exciting issues. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Again, I am Amy Aubrey Levine, the Dean of Workforce Development at Lake Sumter State College. And first of all, I wanted to just thank Lori and Lake Tech and Erica and Elevate Lake for their partnership. Um, I truly appreciate it. I've gone to them really well in the last few months, or last, the last year, as our sponsor. Thank you before we begin, and thank you for helping put this together. Um, I'm here to talk about some of the exciting things that we're planning, proposing to do at the college that align to your industries. And I've talked to some of you in the room already, and, um, so I hope you don't mind if I point you out in a little bit. So what are we planning to do? And the two things that we are planning to do and are working on is, number one, offering an associate science degree in construction management technology. Okay. Um, what we have to do when it comes to associate in science degrees or any degree or certificate that we offer is work through the state curriculum frameworks. I think Dr. Barger might have mentioned this a little bit as well when she was talking about her, her program at Plate. We do have to work through that. We do have ways to structure for local need and local demand and local skills needs specifically. And I'm going to get into a little more detail on that in just a minute. 
And the other thing we're doing is working on a college credit certificate in mechatronics. So that would be a shorter term, some degree, it's going to be part of a degree, and I'll get to that, but it's a shorter term certificate or credential that an individual can get and go straight to the workforce. Okay, so for construction management, what are we looking at? Why do we need that? I looked at the data, and I'm, the data that I'm referring to is that that comes from the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. And this is the data that it revealed. Um, we have 813 positions that will be open over the next seven years. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. And that data is usually lagging a little bit, so it could be greater than that. You know, we could we could survey our employers right here in Lake and Sumter counties and find out something a little bit different. Maybe it's even more than that. The other thing is that's about a 14% growth rate over what we saw and what we'll see in 2018. And what is the average wage that we're going to see? $33. Now that's the average wage. That's not the starting wage. That's the average wage. And that's pretty good. That's great. You know, that's something that we want to see a lot of people get to. Okay, so this program would be a 60 credit hour program. What have we done? What do we need to do to make this happen? We've started doing some local outreach in the area. I know we have Course Lab here, um, Mr. Saul, Course Lab, and also Evergreen Construction. We reached out to them to get their feedback and also provide resources and insight into what they see as needed by their employers and what they see as needed by the future in the industry. What we're going to need to make this happen is you see up there talking about an advisory board. That's very essential. To put that together, to make it begin, we're going to need your input. We're going to need you to come together with us and talk about what you need. We've heard from a few of you but we need to hear from more of you. We want to be comprehensive and make sure we're getting feedback, not just from one or two, but from a good group of companies in the Alpha area. And also, we're looking forward to get these things off the ground. Some of you may know, or may not know, at the colleges, we don't necessarily get money to start up programs. We have to be resourceful and innovative. So we're looking for any type of fiscal or in-kind support. You know, so maybe you as a company have old equipment or have access to software that we could use or that our students could use. Or maybe you do have the opportunity to provide fiscal support. Maybe you can provide just the assistance to get a software program. When you're talking about construction management, you're talking about project management. It's a big piece of that. There's software that's needed for that. There's a cost to that for all the students to have access to that, right? So that could be something that we might, might be helpful with. We're trying to be as innovative and creative as possible to make this happen. The other program that I mentioned that we're working on is Mechatronics. Now this program, if you look here, I did look at the DEO data. Again, this is the Department of Economic Opportunity data. How many positions are we going to see over the next seven years in that area specifically? The data revealed about 263. Now, that could be, again, they were to survey local employers around here, it could be different. It could be greater, it could be a little bit smaller, but that's a good estimate of what it's going to look like. What type of growth is that? That's about 4% growth. And I know Lake Tech is doing some things with Megatronics as well. And I wanted to mention that Lake Tech and Lake Sumter work very closely together when it comes to articulating programs, credits, and making the transition seamless for students. So in each of these programs, should there be a program like HVAC, or let's have a carpentry at Lake Tech, we already do this, and we would continue to work on that when we develop these new programs. We provide students the opportunity to come into our institution with credits or even for the work they've done at Lake Tech. They could come in and they would get, let's say, 20 credit hours. How much money is that going to save them? So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of incentive to make that happen. So we will continue to do that with these two programs. And the average wage, again, this is average, this is not starting, according to the DEO data, is $21 an hour. So this would be a 30 credit hour college venture certificate. How those work, if you're not familiar, is they're always 
part of an AES or an associate in science degree. So in this instance, this certificate is part of the AES Engineering Technology. I know Dr. Barger talked about that earlier today. Um, so what a student could do is they could come in and they could make a decision. I just want to go for this certificate right now. I'm just interested in that. So I'm going to do this 30 credit hours, then I'm going to go out and I'm going to work. And then I have an employer and an employer says, I really think you need to go back. Or are you interested? We've got this incentive funding. We can reimburse you for your tuition or we'll pay for your tuition. And then they can come back and finish the AS in engineering technology. Maybe it'll open more doors for them. Um, it just depends on the student, or maybe the student will want to go straight through. It just depends. I did want to mention that this program is, these programs are going by local financial aid as well. So if a student was interested in, you know, getting federal financial aid, if they're familiar with that, they would have that support as well. One of the interesting things we've done with this program to help get it off the ground is apply for a National Science Foundation grant. Um, we just applied for it earlier this month. We're crossing our fingers. But what that will do is help us with the startup cost for this program. And when you look at the NSF grants, you have to focus and you have to indicate what's going to be special about this, why should they fund it? And we hear so much from employers about soft skills and employability skills and making sure students have that and they're ready to go into the workforce. So when we submitted that grant, we made part of that, the soft skills and employability skills part of that. And what would happen is it would be embedded within the curriculum. And we would work with our partners across the state, um, Dr. Barger and a few other companies or organizations to make sure we had that curriculum and we would pilot it and embed it. We would not just use our institution, but partner institutions across the state, like HCC, Hillsborough Community College, and the College of Central Florida. So we're hoping, we're going to see that, um, we're keeping our fingers crossed, but that would help us to develop that curriculum. It would also help us to get equipment, and it would also help us develop micro-credentials. You know, if we work with the employers, what kind of micro-credentials might you want to see within that mechatronics program? Maybe there's one or two courses gives them what they need to be recognized by your organization to do X. That's something we want to work on as well. Again, just like with the construction manager program, we're looking for fiscal and in-kind support and also advisory board support. We wouldn't want to get this program off the ground, I repeat, without your input as an industry. We need you to provide us what you're looking for, what kind of skills you want them to have. Um, so that's one area we would really appreciate your support. Any fiscal support that you can provide, again, the legislature does not provide the startup funds for programs, so we're trying to be as innovative as possible. And in kind support, things that we've talked about in terms of maybe you can provide an instructor, maybe you can provide equipment, maybe you can provide software. Those are the type of things we need to get them off the ground. We do have plans to get these off the ground in the next year or two. So I will be reaching out to, if I haven't already, um, many of you in the room to help with those various pieces in terms of advisory board or providing feedback, and we would generally appreciate it. All right, there's my contact information. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. I know I reached out to some of you already. We've talked already. Does anybody have any questions? All right, if not, yes? Can you define what Megatronics is? Yes. I'm going to read it. I have an idea of what it is. <laughs> All right, it focuses on designing, manufacturing, and maintaining products that have both me mechanical and electrical components. So you're looking at combining engineering concepts as the electrical and mechanical side. All right, any other questions? Thank you. Again, we keep listening to speakers and realizing all the different resources that are out there and opportunities to partner together. And I think that's what continues to make Lake County such a success, is because we all do work together so that we're not redundant and that we're innovative and creative. So thank you all.
And so I am excited by our last speaker um, because we talked a lot about what are our needs and what's mechatronics and how we, you know, what are we doing and how are we doing this in partnership. But I think one of our big problems is how are we getting our workforce to the job? So I'm really excited to have um, Stephen Alienello from DOT, and he's going to talk to you about some resources and hopefully inspire you. Thank you so much, Eric. So I'm not sure which is worse, that I'm standing between you and this view, or that I'm standing between you and lunch. So I'll, I'll be brief at the end here, but um, I am honored to be able to have the opportunity to share this program with you guys that we have through FDOT. So I don't think a lot of people know that it exists. Well, that's not when we think about what the state of Florida does for transportation. We think about the things that add supply to our networks, right? Roads, bridges, transit in some cases. Um, what our program is as a regional computer assistance program in Central Florida is actually looking at the demand on those systems. So we can keep building and we have to keep building. People just keep moving here, right? Which is a great thing. Um, people are working, which is a great thing. We have traffic. So in addition to the building, though, and adding the supply, supply and demand, we look at where does it make sense for folks that maybe don't even want to drive alone to work every day and taking up that space on the road to have those options. Whether those options are things like sharing the ride, which is what I'll focus on today, um, as well as transit options where they make sense and um, telework and compressed work weeks, um, workforce policy stuff. Um, again, where it makes sense industry-wise. I know when I go to the hospital, I want my doctor to be there in person, but I don't need the 300 accountants to be there necessarily. So um, we do serve what's called District 5, so that does include Lake and Sumter and Marion, as well as the Orlando metro area, and then the Space Coast. So interesting job, we work with literally Mickey Mouse and NASA scientists, and everyone in between. Admittingly, we've been kind of pulled into that Orlando, downtown Orlando area because of the two projects. Sunrail and the Ultimate I-4 construction project. A lot of people needed to know a lot about those projects. Um, with ramps are closing, how does the train work? We have a train here, really, this time, for real? Um, so those pressures have lined up a little bit. The board has gotten out on both of those. Um, so we actually have now a dedicated our specialist who could be here this morning to a meeting, but for Lake County. Um, so we're really excited to share this information because if you are interested in our services, we're here to help. Um, so I kind of mentioned why DOT does this, although kind of the, the community level, right? Decreasing congestion on our roadways has air quality implications and natural resources. Um, and that doesn't just mean, you know, saving trees and air, but, you know, do, can we mitigate how quickly we widen the roads if there are the presence of other options to save some of these beautiful parts, especially here in Lake County? Um, but, you know, what people care about when we talk to them, whether it be the commuter or their bosses, is saving money. Um, for the commuter, it's money that they're spending on transportation. Um, for the employer, of course, it's retention that's usually the thing that um, is the biggest cost when folks can't make that trip anymore. I talked to a gentleman here today, had folks um, from NASCOT coming up to, um, was it? Paris. to Paris. Um, so come right up here from NASCOT and, you know, Ubering there and, you know, with the option of another job maybe closer to home, it's, it's hard to keep doing that. So. We have a lot of lives why we do this. Um, it's not one size fits all. I'm in Orlando, it's I-4, it's traffic. It's my folks who don't like sitting in that traffic and they look for other options. Traffic's great here, relatively speaking. Um, you know, yeah, it's very, very easy. Some turns even easier. Um, but what we see is longer trips. We see miles. We see uh, miles adding up on those cars. Well, changes maybe happen a little bit quicker. Um, but for, for your folks, you know, what are your lives? And it varies. Some of you can relate to some of these up on here. Um, is, it, is it reliability? Is it, is it the retention? Is it finding time maybe from further away um, and, and trying to compete against other regional um, you know, um, activity centers for jobs? So I said I'd focus on ride sharing today for a few reasons. Um, the bus service is limited here, and it could be a whole different conversation about public transportation, but um, we focus on what can we do right now or tomorrow to um, change those commuter options that your employees have. And ride sharing is the easiest. Good old carpool. Before I was part of the program, I didn't believe that there was a program for carpooling. And then being involved in it, I kind of understand why. Um, it doesn't happen the way that it used to. There's lots of people that have studied why that might be. People don't live in workforce housing anymore. Um, people don't like their neighbors anymore. Stranger danger. Um, and then came Uber and Lyft. You know, don't, don't meet strangers on the internet and don't hop in the car with somebody and, and, and Look what we're doing now. We're a lot of money to do that. So um, we finally can answer the question. Yes, we have an app, and you know, rightfully so, we kind of modeled it after what people are already using in their phone to pay a premium to hire a ride. 
Um, but in this case, there's nowhere to put a credit card or a debit card or any kind of anything like that. This is just connecting people who are interested in sharing the ride to go from the same part of Central Florida to the same work center or to the same activity center on a similar schedule to get them connected. So this is available, the state makes it available, it's publicly available, um, but people aren't waking up thinking about, unless the car breaks, you know, how can I find this app? This is where you guys come in. Carpooling is a numbers game. The nice thing about a bus that comes down the street, if it is in your area and it gets you there, is that it's going to come. You don't have to coordinate, you just go outside and get on the bus and go. Carpooling is a little more up for, up for coordination, but what's nice is we get asked a lot, hey, that ride share program, do you go here? Do you go here for these hours? The answer is maybe, it's a numbers game, the more folks that are participating in it, the more likely you are to have other folks from South Lake, maybe mascot, going to Tiberias or nearby. And the longer the trip, the more willing people are usually to meet up at a common location, a park and ride or something like that. So we have this out there available for folks to, on their own, form those car pools, share the expenses. Usually people take turns driving, they don't have to do math, but if it's maybe a group of people um, with one driver, then we do leave it up to the groups to figure out are they pitching in for gas, tolls, um, kind of the 55 cents a mile, or whatever makes sense to them. We don't mandate any of that. And again, we don't collect money through the app at all. Um, we added a layer of incentives, though, again, to get people encouraged to do this. Um, even if they are driving themselves, maybe not having too big of a burden. You guys remember our entertainment book? Those coupons for fundraisers? Um, it's a partner in this app, so you a lot of those carpool trips, it encourages you to keep doing it, and then it also um, allows the employees to get access to pretty good coupons for being a part of that for two reasons. One, we want people to keep doing it, because once you find a carpool, they don't need us anymore. But secondly, we want to know if it's working. You know, we don't just want a big database full of commuter information. We want people to connect and know if, if this is working or do we need to try something else. Um, but for, for your folks, um, for you as a company, for the county maybe as a, as a municipality, as a region, um, we're able to pull those dashboards and see, are we making a difference? Are we saving parking spots? That's a lot of companies wise. You know, maybe not having to expand that parking if they don't have to. Um, are, we, are we saving, um, how much money are we saving folks? If you are doing like an Earth Day or a Green Team or lead certification, um, tracking the CO2 that inherently gets saved by uh, less cars on the road going to and from your work site every day. Um, one other service we, we offer is called Emergency Ride Home. This is an interesting one. So when you talk to people about sharing a ride, one common thing that we'll hear is, well, I don't, no one lives near me, or I don't know anyone lives near me. Hence the app and the ride sharing platform. The other thing is, I've never had my car more than 30 feet away from me. What happens if the day that I car I need to go home early and I get sick because I get sick, or my kids get sick, the school calls, or you know, I car with Mike, we both work eight to five, but now Mike's working late on a deadline. I don't want to be stuck at work. That's a really, you know, that's a, a vulnerable feeling, maybe not to have your car nearby, especially if that's a, a thing you haven't done before. So we say go ahead and try it. You have a car group in your area, um, or you have access to transit, and, and it should work on paper. Go ahead and try it, and if it doesn't, we'll reimburse you for that ride home. Four times a year, so it's, it's not, you know, something, you, uh, an alternate way home all, all year round. But our, our idea there is if you go through all four in the first week or two, it's probably not for you. Keep driving, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get some traffic out of your way. But, you know, most of the time the car just sits in the parking lot getting really, really hot. You go home, at, especially shift work, you know, you go home exactly when you think you're going to go home. Um, don't let that be the, the what if, be the thing that keeps you in traffic, causing traffic, and, and absorbing that cost by yourself in the presence of other options. We reimburse for things like rental cars, Uber Lyft, mileage if it makes the most sense for someone to come pick them up. And um, they do have to be registered as somebody who's um, carpooling, really using transit, um, or even biking to work um, in advance. Yeah, right. Um, and I mentioned we have an hour specialist dedicated to Lake County. I know we're not all tied up in our head all the time. So um, this is where we can really be an extension of your staff, not just because it's a no direct cost benefit for you guys, but um, we will not just give you a flyer and say, you know, good luck. Hope, hope it works. Um, we, we can do the, the table that someone should learn, the, the normal HR toolkit, um, but really find out what matters to your folks, um, where they're coming from, of course, and then let them know about those options that are available. It's going to vary, and their reasons are going to vary based on how far they're coming into work and what their costs are, and a lot of times personal situations. So we're excited to do that. Um, it can turn into some fun things. Carpool parking, you know, um, everyone wants to park close to the front door. That's a great way to save some capacity in your parking lot if, if we're, you know, rewarding folks for maybe not bringing in two or three cars if you're all coming from the same area. Um, if
if you are along the Lake Express routes here in North Lake, um, and it is, we see, hey, you live and work along this route, and your schedule fits in there, and it's just a matter of how I pull the cord, you know, we can, we can teach someone that. Um, I can't move buses for you, I can't get you more buses, that's, that's not my, my deal, but um, if it's a matter of using the existing infrastructure um, and learning how to use it, we can help with that for sure. I think that's it. So that's myself there, as well as our FDOT program manager. Um, we're at the end, but I'm I'm here, so I'm going to be able to stay for questions now or after we're done. Okay. Sir, so, what's the app? The app link. What's it called? Yeah, great question. Um, we need to add that slide, don't we? It just came out in the summer. It's rethink your commute. So if you search for that in Android or um, the Apple Store, you will find it. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Uh, we do work with college and universities as well. Um, you end up having to commute. It's a little harder, right? Um, it's hard to get that data clean because people change schedules and you know, call me when they do. Um, but now with the app versus more of a static than we had before, it'll nudge you. You know, after a couple of months, hey, this is this still your information? So it can work really well for that because you have a home, you have a destination, and you're going there frequently, usually on a schedule. Thank you all. That was a nice way to end a good day. I'm super excited. I hope that you feel like you're taking away some information. I hope you will stay and mingle. The coffee pots are dry. I'm very sad. I did not get my second cup. But there is still some lovely desserts and pastries from Lake Tech. Please eat them. I do not need to eat them all on my own, which I will do. So I really appreciate all of you. We will probably be sending out a survey be vicious, be honest, be kind. Um, we certainly would like to be able to do this again, and we want to make sure it's good for you, not just about what we think. But I really do appreciate all of our speakers today. I think they all want something different for everybody, and everyone drive safe, mingle, eat, and drink. Question. Can you, can you provide us copies of the presentation? Yes, what I think we're going to do is send it out to everyone. I'm not technical. I'm looking at Lori. We will get it out to everybody. Okay. Please give you a destination to be able to find it. Thank you. All right. Thank you all very much.